Small Business Tuesday continues with Your Money, Your Call. Hello and welcome to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Julia Lee from Bell Direct. If you have a question about shares, our phone lines are open right now on 1300 30 34 35 or you can always email us on yourmoney at skynews.com.au. And joining me on the panel tonight, we're very lucky to have Andrew Page from The Motley Fool and also Michael Gable from Fairmont Equities. So it's a day where not much happened on the market except, you know, Woodside made a takeover bid for oil search. The energy space has been one of those areas that has just been absolutely hammered. Over the past 52 weeks, the energy sector is down 41%. And just over the last quarter, we've seen a loss of 21%. So does this signal the bottom in energy stocks? Let's start off by asking Michael Gable. Michael, we'll start off with a technical view. Yeah. Where do you view the market going in particular mm. and specifically the energy space? Yeah, the overall market, um, obviously it's moving more on, on emotion than, than logic at the moment. Um, it'll, it'll take a few more weeks, about a month, for all this fear to, to wash out. Obviously all the, uh, all the fearsome stories come out um, at this time. And, um, but I think the time to be fearful of the market is when everyone's super positive and, and super bullish. And, and that's not uh, the time at the moment. So um, technically speaking, I think the market looks like it wants to rally here in the short term. Um, possibly up to about 54, 5500, but um, we may well see these current levels uh, again in about a month's time. So um, there's no huge rush uh, to get involved tomorrow. Um, but in terms of energy stocks, I don't necessarily think it's a bottom um, for energy stocks because uh, oil itself, I don't think, is going anywhere in a hurry. So while you know today's news with Woodside and All Search can be a little bit exciting if you're an All Search holder. Um, I'd actually be using that as an opportunity to sell, and we have had a couple of clients hanging on to All Search, and I use that opportunity today to sell. So it comes back to the price of oil, in my opinion, and we just don't see an end in sight to the low prices. Okay, so outside of Woodside and Oil Search, well, what about Santos now? The stock saw an increase of more than five percent. Mm. Is this a positive development for Santos? Look, I'd, I'd be, and we do hold, we do have clients holding a little bit of Santos. Look, I'd be using any sort of rally here again to probably exit. Um, and, the, and one of the main reasons why I say that, apart from the fact that I don't think oil is going anywhere in a hurry, it's because the market itself, it's not as though we're sitting at 6,000 and we're struggling to find uh, value and opportunity out there in terms of alternative investments. I mean, at the moment, the market's down at 5,000. We're extremely lucky in that we've just gone through reporting season in August. So we have all this updated com company information. Everything's laid out on the table. Um, so during the next few weeks, we need to be smart about this. We need to use that information and find the opportunities in the market over the next few weeks. It's not buying stocks like your oil searches and your Santos's. There's companies out there that reported really well, and it's a case of just weeding out the, the bad ones, finding the good ones, and taking up those opportunities. We'll, we'll put you on the spot regarding some of those companies later on in the show. But talking about opportunities, Andrew, and um, one of the areas that has been beaten down so badly outside of the energy space are the banks. And, you know, Commonwealth Bank, it's got the retail offer open at the moment. Goldman Sachs has sub underwritten. They must be a little bit worried given where the share prices of the banks are at the moment. But, you know, Commonwealth Bank with a 6% historical year yield 8% on a fully frank basis and then you look at ANZ even bigger 6.6% on a fully frank basis you know closer to a 9% yield would you be a buyer of the banks uh, well you know I'm all about dividends I love a, I love a good fully frank dividend but you you can't look at it in isolation there were people when the banks were much higher talking about how how great the yield was and the yield was reasonable then especially when you look at it in context of what you're going to get in the term deposit or something else but when the share price falls 20% you need a hell of a lot of dividends to sort of make up for the shortfall there. I don't think that, you know, although things start to look pretty cheap relative to those highs that they were at, I still don't think they represent great value. They were insanely priced to my way of thinking and they're still a little bit silly at this point in time. Um, don't get me wrong, Julia, I think if you were to buy any of the banks now, I'm sure if you look back in five and ten years you'll get a very 
decent, adequate rate of return, but I don't think it's going to be market beating. And as I was saying to Michael before the show, I mean, if you're in this game of trying to buy direct individual shares, you've got to be trying to beat the market. I mean, otherwise, just buy an exchange traded fund, guarantee yourself the market average, go and play golf all day. You'll beat most of the professionals, you know? So um, it isn't a question of is, is, is CBA a terrible investment? I don't think it is. Is it the kind of investment that's going to give you some really attractive long-term double-digit type of returns, the kind of returns that it has delivered in the past, um, I don't think so. I think that the structural factors that led to that growth in earnings aren't going to be as dominant in, in the next uh, decade. And for those reasons, I think there will come a time when, the, when these represent outstanding value, but, but not at the moment. And let's just remember, too, the reason they're doing these capital raising is to repair their balance sheets. They were way over leveraged. They're not, you know, not for me. Okay, so no for the banks from Andrew and the energy, you know, Michael, you're seeing it as, as a chance to sell as well. So interesting times on the market. Let's go to our first caller. We have John on the line from WA. John, welcome to the show. What's your question for our panel tonight? Uh, good evening, Julia. I just want to ask the guys about the Northern Star. They announced a gold bond. I haven't bought a gold bond for years, but um, this one here, they seem to have money in the bank and they've increased their profits. And uh, I just thought maybe with the Aussie dollar, the Aussie dollar gold price sort of edging up. Um, and the, uh, I think their cost uh, per ounce to produce is quite reasonable as well. Sure. I mean, I have to admit, I bought Northern Star and Evolution mining last Monday, both paying dividends. So Evolution went ex-dividend last week and Northern Star goes ex-dividend in a couple of days. Um, so both companies, you know, dividend paying and, of course, the Aussie dollar falling and they're both Aussie dollar dominated um, mines and miners. Um, but, you know, the gold miners have been a volatile play, and I, I must admit I bought it for a short-term play on the Aussie dollar as much as stability in the gold price. Um, Michael, what are your thoughts here? Um, the gold space isn't one that, that I'm involved with. Uh, I'm not too happy about... I'm not very confident about where the gold price is going at the moment, and um, even if I was confident, then I'd have to obviously try to pick the right company because there are some shockers out there and there are some great ones and from what I understand Northern Star is one of the the great companies if you were to getting involved in the gold space um, so look if you take a view that gold's heading up um, then this is probably the pick I mean in terms of the chart it's one of the few gold stocks which is still in a long-term uptrend I mean it does look really good from a charting perspective um, it has been easing back over the last few months is you know, today the buying point, or is it going to ease back a little bit more? Um, I'm not sure, but it looks like it's getting close to, to finishing this little shorter term uh, pullback, and it, it'll probably resume the uptrend. As I said, it's, it's probably the pick out there. So if you're positive on gold, I think Northern Star is the one that you look at. Okay, Northern Star, um, how about you, Andrew? Um, if, it's an interesting trivia fact. If you were to go back five years and you could only buy one share, um, I'm, I'm not a uh, gold investor by any stretch of the imagination, but this would be the one to buy. I mean, this is this has outperformed every other company on the ASX. Um, it's a 60% per annum uh, shareholder return <laughs> over that period. So, I mean, you would have put, you know, 12 grand in this and come out with something like a million dollars in five years. It is, it is the reason why people get involved in resource companies because for every 99 that go very poorly, and that's generally the, the odds, there's one like this that just go well. And that's why we all play the lottery as well. We know the odds are terrible, but <laughs> you've got to be in it to win it, right? So um, all of that being said, the, the, the success has been remarkable. Um, yeah, I, I, I believe the caller when he says they've probably got very good uh, pricing in terms of what they're able to extract it for. They seem very re reasonably geared, very, uh, very low levels of gearing, very attractive pricing. All of those kinds of things make sense. But as Michael, I mean, he hit the nail on the head. It depends on where you think the price of gold is going. And I've yet to meet anyone in my time in this industry who's ever accurately predicted that. So if you're one of those people great and you think it's going up absolutely um, if you like me and you have no idea where the price of this commodity or any other commodity is going uh, longer term then it's it's just a bit of a gamble okay so um, 
Andrew's staying away from the gold stocks. Michael, not a fan. Julia's bought into a couple of the gold stocks last week. <laughs> Aussie dollar has been falling. Evolution mining is up 80% over the past year. Northern Star up 40%. And as long as the Aussie dollar keeps falling and the gold price stays relatively stable, it's looking pretty good for the gold miners. Having said that, a lot of it is priced in. So just be careful. But both of these gold miners, Evolution and Northern Star, both have been paying dividends at least for the past three years. Let's go to a caller now. We have Luke on the line from Brisbane. Luke, welcome to the show. Uh, yes, Julia. How are you tonight? Good. And uh, just a question for Michael. I'm just Sorry. wondering, he's saying that there's going to be a bounce of 5,500. After that bounce, do we test the lows of 4,800? <laughs> What's his opinion? Sure. Yeah. Bull then a bear. Um, what, what do you think, Michael? Are we going to have a short-term bounce of mm. 5,500 only for that to be the start perhaps of a, a bear market what do you think yeah probably um, that's that's probably uh, what's going to happen Luke I mean I've I don't have a short uh, memory I, I this to me this feels like 2011 um, I sent a couple of charts out to, to clients a couple of weeks ago and it's almost uncanny um, when the market got sold off in 2011 if you compare it uh, to what's been happening here over the last few months um, it's very similar so we had this period where the market pulled back about 10%. It looked like it was getting a foothold uh, and would rally, but in the end, it, it dropped down very suddenly. So when you see markets move pretty much in a straight line and, and shed 15% or what have you in, in a very short period of time, uh, they almost always bounce back straight away in a straight line. But the thing is, it, it takes time for, um, for a low to get established. So we get a bit of a V-shaped move, and I think we're still going to see the last part of that initial v-shape move up um, but then we'll probably drift back and it might take a month uh, a month and a half and it'll, it'll be very frustrating for for investors wondering look are we going to continue sliding we're going to head up um, but ultimately we'll probably retest this sort of 5,000 whether it's 49 4,800 um, it's hard to say but we'll pretty much be back around here so that's why I'm trying to reiterate the point that we've got a few weeks at least of trying to find some good opportunities for when we do get there uh, in about a month and a half's time and then from there that should be the low for the year and um, we should continue heading higher. Okay, so that was on the sell-off that we've seen in the ASX 200 index on the market. We now have an email here from Joe, and Joe asks, I was hoping to get the panel's view on Newcrest Mining and a mid- to long-term forecast for the mining space. Well, I know that both of you don't like yep. gold, so I'm guessing Newcrest might be out of it. Um, what do you think? We'll start off with Andrew this time. Uh, no idea. Hmm. <laughs> Michael? Um, again, comes back to the gold price. Newcrest, um, you know, not, not as quality, not as high quality as, um, uh, as Northern Star. I mean, pull up a chart of Newcrest and you can see that uh, uh, the, the share price reflects um, all the issues they've had. Uh, I know they had a fatality there the other day and, mm. and shares were suspended. Um, I'll at least give, give a, an opinion on the chart. A bit neutral at the moment. I mean, it looks like it's trying to find a bit of a, um, a flaw here in the mid-11s, but I think it's still at risk of heading back um, possibly under $10 again. So um, I definitely do not see a buy, uh, buying opportunity here on the chart. Um, I'd have to wait for either a decent pullback under $10 um, or I'd like to see some decent upside momentum. So at the moment, it's a bit you know, neither here nor there. Um, other opportunities out there at the moment. And I guess different from Evolution Mining and Northern Star, which have paid dividends for the past three years at least, Newcrest has suspended its dividend program. So 2014, 2015, mm -hmm. we haven't seen a dividend. So it does look like they might have to plug in more cash into some of the projects that they have on hand. Yeah, and not paying a dividend. I mean, I, you know, I, I speak to my clients quite regularly, all of them, and I, I know that if they're stuck in a stock, I know from experience, if, if you've got someone stuck in a stock and it's not paying a dividend, it becomes a sore point because at least if you're getting a dividend out of something that's not going anywhere, uh, at least, you know, preferably we don't want to see it go down, but at least if it's not going anywhere and you're getting a dividend, it's a bit more palatable. Um, but, you know, if you're not getting a dividend and the share price isn't going anywhere and you're looking at everything else go up and paying a good divvy, it's, yeah, it's tough. Okay, on that note, we'll be back with more after this short break. But if you'd like to speak with our expert panel, please give us a call on 1300 30 34 35 or you can always email us your money at skynews.com.au.
Welcome back to your money, your call. We are still taking your calls on 1300 30 34 35 and your emails, your money at skynews.com.au. And we now have Tom on the line from Wagga Wagga. Tom, welcome to the show. What's your question tonight? Yes, John, Julia, thanks for taking the call. Um, in January, I, I purchased um, Bellamy's and Blackmore's oh, for nice. our Silk Me <laughs> Super Fund. Sure. And they've had a, an absolute unbelievable run. I just wonder what um, the panel thinks. I'm up 90%. I've topped up three times wow. on both of them on the way through. Oh, nice way topping what, up. Should I be pulling, pulling these profits out or do I let them run? So, Tom, do you have any other stock tips <laughs> <laughs> while we have you on the line? Blackmore's and Bellamy's, fantastic run. Um, both of these stocks have done amazingly well. Year to date, um, Blackmore's is actually up more than 200% and Bellamy is also up more than 200%. I have to admit, I sold out of Bellamy's at $5 because I thought the valuation was ridiculous and the stocks reached another all-time high, hitting, um, closing up $6.40 today and Blackmore's $118.05. Andrew, what do you, <laughs> you remember think? when everyone was trying to make a bet as to which company was going to be the first to sort of crack that $100 mark? For the second time for the CSL. Yeah, you yeah, know, and, and uh, this was one that I don't think anyone saw coming. Uh, look, uh, I, I, a couple of things here. I think both of these are stories about China uh, at, at the end of the day. The vitamin market in, in, um, in China is just going gangbusters. It's, it, that, that's where I think a lot of the growth has come from. Blackmore's not directly so, but a lot of perhaps source through Australian operations. Um, I think uh, with Bellamy's as well, they've got a wonderful product. I know that my colleagues at Motley Fool Pro were on this, uh, geez, less than half uh, the current price and still rate it as a buy. They, they like it a lot. And the thing that these guys do very well, and I think it's a hard lesson for, for, mem for, for investors to learn, is that we always base our positions on what we paid for them. So we look backwards and the caller said, you know, I'm up 90%, do I sell? And I think it's, it's we've got to invert the thinking there. It's more a question of, forget what the market is saying to you. If, if you were a billionaire and you could just buy this business outright, what would you be prepared to pay? And in forming that view, you would look at the business as it is today and think about where it's going in the future. So what are the earnings today? What are they like to be next year and the year after that? And then form your price, around, form your your idea of value or judgment of value around the future. You can't go backwards in time. So it doesn't really matter what the price was when you paid for it. It's worth what it is now. And the question is, do you want to say, stay with it? I absolutely commend Tom for having the discipline to add to things as they're going up. It is oh, a very, absolutely. very difficult thing to do. So even though now, having said all of that, they can absolutely get to a point where I think things get a little bit crazy and it is sensible to sell. But if you're investing in these companies rather than just trying to speculate in their share price and you believe that there's long-term potential in these businesses, um, I wouldn't be selling just by virtue of the profit alone. Um, I'd probably be more closer to a, to a sell with Blackmores as opposed to, to Bellamy's. Um, but um, I, I haven't done the, the, the due diligence necessary to put a price wow. on, on either because, of Because, you know, Bellamy's has a profit of $9.1 million. It has yep. a market capitalization of $608 million. This yep. is a stock that IPO'd last year for $1. Yep. It's now trading at $6.41. Yep. My concern with Bellamy is that they've never been able to keep up with demand. They're having to now Pretty good problem to have. Import in um, uh, organic mm. milk powder from overseas, mm. New Zealand, because they can't source enough in Tasmania. Yep. Not only that, they don't have their own processing facilities. It's so they actually they process outsource it. through bigger, so they're limited in the amount they can process. They've outsourced all the there. capital intensive stuff. They've got the better part of the business there. But if they're growing and that strongly, you know. Wait a second, you're saying it's a negative that they're growing so strongly? This is a wonderful thing. Long may it continue. Long may my companies have the problem of growing too fast. Growing too fast is not a problem as long as you can keep up with Abs demand. Absolutely, you're right. You don't want to overstretch yourself, but I think that the key thing is it looks expensive based on what they were making last year. It's about what they're going to be making next year. And these, If they're these making are... $60 million next year, don't have a problem, but if they're sticking to around <laughs> about that $9 million figure and they're growing well that to $12 million, then then you know the valuations okay. are a bit stretched. Mm. Blackmores and Bellamy's, would you be buying in at these levels? Um, Look, I'd be thinking of it in terms of a, from a portfolio construction point of view. So, assuming that um, Tom, you got in at, at the right sort of um, uh, uh, weightings, um, they probably uh, they probably have weightings now which are probably too large um, for your portfolio. I mean, it doesn't matter how good a company is. You have to, you know, I'm not going to throw numbers out there because that, that comes down to personal advice. But you know, you have to think about 
look, doesn't matter how good a company is, do you really want that much of your portfolio tied up uh, in one of these companies? Because anything can happen. Um, the way they're trading at the moment, they're probably expensive. Um, the way that they've gone up vertically recently suggests that um, everyone's excited and, and rushing into the stock and, and pushing it probably far beyond where it deserves to be. It probably still deserves to be much higher than what you paid for it, but probably not as high as, as where it is now. And look, I don't, I don't have a short memory. I've been doing this show for five years. I remember all the calls we used to get about Linus. Um, remember that stock? Uh, you know, as it was pushing towards $2, $2.50, $2.60, $2.70. Um, for those who forgot about Linus, it's now tr trading at $0.03. Cents. So I know that's a different kettle of fish, but that's another example of you know, it's run hot, maybe it's time to take a little bit off the table and just protect your portfolio um, just in case something happens and, uh, and these shares pull back. Okay, so congratulations to Tom on such a fantastic run on Blackmores and Melamines. Both of these stocks up more than 200% in the year to date. And our panellists, um, some different opinions and some good words of advice there coming through. Let's go to our next caller. We have Adonis on the line from Melbourne. Welcome. What's your question tonight? Hi, Julia. I'm after a uh, technical view on both uh, Santa Barbara and uh, Select Harvest. Santa Barbara's had a nice uh, um, upside breakout from 70 cents, and I'm looking at about 80, 84 as a as a, a target. Um, and also, Select Harvest seems to have presented a nice little inside bullish bar, and I'm just wondering whether um, Michael thinks he can get back up to that uh, $14 range. Uh, on this next leg up. Sure, so let's start off with St. Barbara Mines. It looks like the gold stocks are just gold rushing it in mm. today. <laughs> About half of our questions. St. Barbara Mines this time. Um, Adonis um, bullish on it for a short term trade. What do you think, Michael? Yeah, Adonis, um, good, good pick. Um, yeah, you, you, the target's there in terms of um, in the 80s, I think that's where it's going to go. Um, obviously, there was a break there above about 59, 60 cents. So if it goes under that, um, that's where we'd, we'd place our stops. But um, well spotted, I think, I think you're right on that one. Um, select Harvest, uh, I'm just having a look at a weekly chart here. I'm just a little bit concerned about price action over the last, say, two months. So uh, it peaked there, or, yeah, about, about the last month and a half. So it peaked there in early July. Um, we can see that it got sold off from about just over 13 to just over $11 in the space of a week. Then in three weeks, it couldn't, over, couldn't go to a new high um, and then got smashed down again. So far this week, it's up a little bit. Um, to me, it just looks a little bit, uh, a little bit shaky here. But um, so out of the two, um, St. Barbara looks like the pick there. OK, so Michael picking St. Barbara Mines. I mean, Andrew, I know you don't like the gold stocks, but what about Select Harvest? Looking at almonds, mm. um, the stocks, you know, recently seen a record high and then seen a little bit of a pullback. There's a drought in California and that's causing almond prices to go through the roof. Yeah. It's now the time to be buying or selling. Yeah, no, I think the opportunity's kind of passed there. I mean, it was a colleague of mine um, absolutely picked this one. He's got an agricultural background and just, you know, the market market just seem to miss the fact that, you know, again, it's a commodity, right? So it's, it's all about supply and demand. You know, the supply really dried up from the other major uh, producer and it just really left Select Harvest in an absolute sweet spot. But um, the market um, isn't always irrational for long periods of time. It realised the error of its ways and it's kind of priced that in. So the, I think a, a large part of that upside is, is kind of gone and you are left with certainly a, a reasonable company for what it does, but one that's in a, in a you know, longer term a tough industry and one where that, that opportunity, that shorter term opportunity has passed in my view. Okay, on that note, we will be back with more after this short break. If you would like to speak with our expert panel, please give us a call on 1300 30 34 35 or you can email us at yourmoney at skynews.com.au. Welcome back to the program. Joining me on the panel tonight, we have Andrew Page from The Motley Fool and also Michael Gable from Fairmont Equities. And I'm Julia Lee from Bell Direct. So if you have a question you'd like answered, please give us a call on 1300 30 34 35 and you can always email your money at skynews.com.au. And we now have Nathan on the line from Melbourne. Nathan, welcome to the show. What's your question for our panel tonight? Hi, guys. Yeah, I'm calling about two stocks. Uh, the first one is Slater and Gordon. Obviously, they've had a bit of you know, negative market media recently with uh, all the stuff that's gone on, and sure. the price has come down a fair bit. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if it's moving into more of a buy zone now that it's sort of under the $3 mark. Mm -hmm. And... 
Retail food group, similar sort of situation. Um, they've already proven that they can do it here in Australia and they look like they're going to move into China as well. Just wondering what, you, what the uh, panel's prospects are sort of for the long term in, uh, in China and elsewhere. Sure, so having a look at Slater and Gordon and Retail Food Group. We'll start off with Slater and Gordon. The stock $2.75 today. Um, it's been under a lot of pressure, a lot of shorting in the stock as well. And this, of course, over its purchase of Quindell over in the UK. Um, we have hedge funds heavily involved in this one. I um, have to admit, I was a buyer hmm. of Slater and Gordon after that fall, but the stock's just kept on falling. So we might go to Michael. It is looking hugely oversold at the moment, but yeah. you know, is it due for a bounce? Will it bounce? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, just based on company fundamentals, I think it's still very much up in the air. Um, I mean, if you have a look at the big brokers that are covering it, uh, I think on average they, they believe it's trading at half what it's, what it's valued at. But I mean, yeah, we just, uh, it, is, it, is, it is very difficult to value this, I think, at it's the moment. It's such but a hard one. I mean, I'm looking at valuations. The lowest one's UBS, $3.10, and then you have Deutsche Bank at $5, and then you have Morgan's at $7.52, yeah. <laughs> all across the whole spectrum. So, you know, but, but we know often, often when all the brokers are, are taking one opinion, it's usually the, uh, the other side that works out uh, to be correct, which means there's, there's probably more downside. Um, but in terms of the chart, look, I, I don't really see any... Um, uh, I don't see it being a buy right now. I mean, it looks like it's starting to slow down, this, this, uh, uh, this pullback. It might even get under 250, but... I think with something like this, especially considering how violent the pullback's been and, and considering that we don't really know what the value is, um, I wouldn't be jumping in just yet. I'd be waiting for, um, for a decent bounce in it. You know, you might miss the first you know, 30% or, or whatever it is as it goes from maybe $2 to you know, $2.60 um, or whatever. But look, down here, um, I couldn't be buying it. Again, better op opportunities in the market. Okay, so better opportunities. I mean... Slater and Gordon, this purchase was supposed to be transformational, and I guess it has been in a negative way for the company. Um, but just having a look at the 2015 result, net profit after tax of $82 million. That was up 6% on the previous year. Mm. Lots of negativity in the stock. What do you mm. think? Andrew? Yeah, I think the, the reason that the analysts are coming up with such a wide range here is it's a hell of a lot of confusion amongst the financials and some of the accounting policies that Slater and Gordon are employing. So as I understand it, there is... Uh, there is um, debate over how you treat work in progress and depending on how that sort of lands up it, it will it will swing the models and therefore swing the valuations and there's just a hell of a lot of uncertainty there you know I think underlying all of that in terms of the cash generation you know cash never lies and in terms of the the cash generation capacity of the business it's been a real success and it's grown strongly and if they can make it work in the UK it will continue to go strongly there's a strong industry tailwind in that sector they're, they're very good operators there but for me, while ever there's this uncertainty, I mean, when you get to a stage, there's, there's absolutely no shame in putting stuff in the too hard basket. And when I started running the rule over Slater, it was just too hard, quite frankly, and I got, I got very lost. So without sort of going to, you know, a team of forensic accountants and spending five weeks sort of going through it um, and still being none the wiser, I kind of, for me, I was sort of happy to put that in the too hard basket and go with something that's easier to understand. And I, I guess for me it's a question of trust and the market just doesn't trust what Slater and Gordon is saying at the moment. But if you do, then there's potential upside there. Unfortunately, it looks like a binary outcome. Either the short sellers win or the longer term hmm. <laughs> players on the market win. So very hard one, Slater and Gordon. The other stock was Retail Food Group, another stock that's been under immense amount of pressure. Stock's almost halved um, from that peak we saw. It has Gloria Jean coffee shops, number of food outlets. Um, in a lot of ways, it's almost reliant on consumer spending, consumer mm. confidence. What do you think of this one, Michael? Yeah, they, um, their results were fairly in line. Maybe, um, um, you know, maybe their expectations for, for the following year were a little bit conservative. But uh, generally, it's looking cheap down here. Um, the valuations... Uh, a little bit higher than where it is at the moment. I mean, the chart doesn't look too good, but compared with something like Slater and Gordon, where you can't really value it, at least with Retail Food Group, um, it's a little bit easier to figure out a valuation for it. So it's easier to throw yourself in there on a chart that probably doesn't look the best and, and maybe pick it up around current levels. I think it goes ex-dividend in a couple of days' time. So um, tomorrow's probably the last day for that. But uh, there's a bit of support here in the mid-fours. Um, 
yeah, I think it's probably been a bit oversold over the last uh, couple of weeks. Okay, so yes to Retail Food Group. It uh, does go ex-dividend on the 10th of September um, for 11.75 cents. I mean, all the things I love, donuts, bread, coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Why is the share price not doing so well? Uh, look, I, th I think it's, you know, the, it's a pendulum, you know. The market gets overexcited about things and it gets overly pessimistic about things. And you, you've got to, for my money as a long-term investor, ignore that and just focus on what the business is doing. They delivered a record result. It was an outstanding uh, result. Um, the dividends uh, have yet again increased. They've, I think they've never once not increase the dividends even throughout the GFC. They are extremely savvy operators in the in the space that they they operate, which is sort of the franchise slash food space. Um, so I, I think that this is actually an opportunity for long-term investors. I mean, who knows what the share price will do? But if their growth trajectory is anything like what it has been in the past, even and inevitably, the law of large numbers, you know, it is going to slow down. But you're looking at a company on a what a P of 12 or something, which with some very um, very reasonable growth expectations in five and a half percent fully franked and this is this is an opportunity this is exactly what you like to see frankly it's it's a it's a wonderful business where the market gets so obsessed with the short term and the rest of it that it just sort of it you know gets carried away on itself and at some point it'll turn and maybe that's below the current price I don't know but the question as always for me is is it a good business is it a good price if those if the answer to those two things are yes and you're prepared to, to you know sit on things for a while you'll do well it's, a, it's an okay. easy formula okay so both of our panelists willing to uh, back retail food group RFG is a stock code there let's go to our next call Bob from Mudgy. Bob welcome to the show what's your question tonight for our panel? Hi Julie yeah look hi Julia my question is regarding um, two stocks one is M&S Magnus Resources I've rung about them before and they're traveling quite well yeah. that's a graphite stock and the other one is uh, PLS Bara Minerals, they're in lithium. lithium. Um, yeah, what, what does the panel think of these two stocks at the moment? Sure, interesting. I've been having conversation about both of these stocks over the last few weeks. Um, Magnus Resources, the guy who sits next to me at work, is in this one. His hairdresser um, recommended this one and he's had a beautiful <laughs> ride up, so he's been telling me how well the stock price has been doing um, pretty much every day. Yeah, I hope he's not an analyst, this guy you sit next to. <laughs> no, <laughs> That's yeah. where he's getting his ideas from. Yeah. You know, God he's done really well, Graphite yeah. Company and Pilbara oh, Minerals. Yeah. We had a client dinner last week mm. and um, one of the clients said this one's one to look at, Lithium Company over in WA. Um, so having a look at Magnus Resources and Pilbara Minerals, both very small companies, Thoughts, Michael? Um, so I don't know anything about them, but um, I can give an opinion on the chart. So Magnus Resources, in my opinion, Bob, it looks like it's um, it's finished this little uh, rally up here. So um, good, you've picked a good move there. But um, when I have a look at it on the weekly chart, it looks like it's not going to push higher just yet. Um, it's going to ease back. Whether it's going to head sideways for a while or um, or pull back quite deeper, I'm just not sure until it breaks to a new high. Um, but in terms of PLS, um, Pilbara Minerals, um, that, thing's, that thing's on the move. So that's, that's looking good. 50% um, over the past two weeks. Yeah, but what's, what's um, really important is if you have a look at this stock longer term, um, I mean, yeah, over the last, say, six months, it's gone from about $0.05 cents to, to $0.19. Cents, but um, you will notice that over the last five years, it's been base building. And the longer that base builds, when it does break out, you get you know, more, a more explosive move. So in my mind, it's, it's probably can even double from here, just purely based on, on the technicals. I don't know anything about the company, but, um, but from a charting perspective, you know, the volume's coming in. Um, it looks like there could be some more upside. Okay, so, I mean, both very small companies, but any view on lithium and graphite? Uh, no and no. And I'll tell you what, I'll give you, I'll give you a couple of um, stats here. This is uh, some Magnus, right? It looks like a heart rate monitor, the chart. So it, it sort of, you get the, the pulse up and then you get the pulse down and it just does that. So, you know, back in 06, you could have bought it for 20 cents and uh, six months later, you would have got it for $2. So tenfold increase in prices, and I guarantee you at the time, probably plenty of calls coming through um, on this show at that time. Back in 2010, it was trading at 16 cents a share. A short time later, it was at 80 cents a share. So every so often, the market gets really excited about this business, and it flies up. But when you sort of dig below the surface there, and you see a business that has never made one red cent, you see a business that su survives by virtue of issuing lots and lots of shares, and that's how it gets its money. 
And that's not to be critical of these guys. I mean, this is what these kinds of companies do. It's a very capital, labor-intensive type operation and it just takes a lot of money to sort of get something to a, a viable economic entity. Sadly, the, statist the statistics are that it doesn't often happen. So I would implore the caller to forget the share price, look at what the business is doing. Do you think that this time is different? Are they actually, maybe they have, I don't know this company, are they actually, have they found something, are they going to be able to dig it up in an economic way and sell it? And are they going to be able to do that for a meaningful period of time? And if the answer to that is no, it could double from here, it could half from here, but you know, certainly longer term it's not going to do well unless those earnings come through. Okay, so both speculative stocks, but both stocks that have done extremely well. Looking at Magnus Resources, uh, you're looking at uh, a graphite company and of course um, Pilbara Minerals, you're looking at lithium and looking at those um, commodities, they have been growing in popularity because of the lithium battery and of course technology uh, eating up some of those resources, but the shares have also been quite volatile. Let's go to our next call. We've got Max on the line from Melbourne. Max, welcome to the show. What's your question tonight? Hi guys, love the show. Just after an opinion on two companies. Uh, first one, Dick Smith Holdings, and the second one, 3P Learning, please. Sure, so Dick Smith and 3P Learning. DSH for Dick Smith and 3PL for 3P Learning. Unfortunately, I think both of these stocks haven't been doing so well from memory. Um, Dick Smith keeps on coming up with reaching an all-time record low, and 3P Learning. Um, I like the idea behind it, um, selling these uh, software programs to students to get better at maths and reading. Um, but once again, another stock that keeps on hitting new lows. Mm. So um, are they bargains around this level, Andrew? Or I don't know 3P Learning, so I won't comment on that. I think Dick Smith, I mean, Woolies got out of that for a very good reason. You know, I think there was a lot of people sort of celebrating how silly Woolies was when they did because, you know, the, the price seemed to do fairly well for a while. But it's a, it's a business that's, look, it's reasonably mature. It's in a very sort of competitive space, particularly with JB Hi-Fi. Uh, it's a business that's facing a lot of sort of price deflation on a lot of its things, on a lot of the goods that it sells. It's retail. Retail's always a tough operation. Um, it's just very hard. So, look, there will be a point at which value is, is, is evident. I, I don't know where that is. I haven't done the work. But I, I, I'm, I'm less... I'm, I'm more attracted to other areas of, of, of the market. Okay, so you don't think it's a turnaround story for Dick Smith? I think it'll be around in the next five years and I think it'll you know, probably be earning a little bit more at that point in time, but it's not going to be anything market beating, I don't think. I guess the problem of mm. a mixture of you know, lower like-for-like -like store sales and opening new stores yeah. isn't a good combination. Um, but you know, is this going to be a turnaround play? The stock has fallen really um, deeply. Yeah, look, potentially to some extent. I mean, it's fallen from $2 to, to about $1.33. So, um, yeah, like-for-like like sales weren't very good. I think from memory they, uh, they were discounting a lot of Apple products and then they, they wound that back. They were just trying to get um, a lot of foot traffic and, and when they thought they, they did, they, they wound back those, those discounts. But I think a lot of analysts feel as though they need to continue with those discounts get get uh, get the feet through the through the door there but um, I remember reading that Dick Smith was looking to um, sell small appliances so if we remember with JB Hi-Fi a couple of years ago they moved into JB JB Hi-Fi home or whatever they call it um, it's a good margin business it's doing well for them Dick Smith is trying to do the same thing it'll take a while um, but look it so they've got a, a bit of a strategy in place um, maybe down here it starts to get interesting but I couldn't be buying it um, just yet, I think it's going to spend a bit of time uh, down at these lower levels, so no need to rush in. Um, um, 3P Learning? 3P Learning, I don't follow it. Look, our mate Gary Glover loves it, so Gary Glover who's often on this show, so you should give him a call. Um, he likes it, he could probably tell you all about it, I don't know much about it. Okay, so that was Dick Smith and 3P Learning, and on that note we're taking a short break, but we'll be back to answer more of your questions in just a moment. If you would like to speak with our expert panel, please give us a call now on 1300 30 34 35, or you can email yourmoney at skynews.com.au. Welcome back to the show. If you have a question you'd like answered, please pick up the phone, give us a call, the number's on your screen there, 1300 30 34 35, or you can always email us on your money at skynews.com.au. And we now have an email from Peter who asks, CSR looks appealing on paper, but it's currently unloved by investors. Interested in the panel's view as to whether it's a buy at current levels, despite issues in the aluminium space. 
So problems in aluminium, seeing the share price of CSR under a lot of pressure. In fact, today's finishing just above that $3 mark. And that's despite the positive nature of the Australian building space and a lot of these building uh, materials companies doing quite well so Andrew CSR is this one that you'd be back in? No it's, it's just a tough it's another tough gig you know they these guys are, are earning about the same as they were 10 years ago so you know every now and again when when things go their way they, they get carried along with that wave when when they face a bit of a um, headwind and they sort of fall back because of that it's, it's just it's just a tough space so you know I prefer companies that um, are, are price makers businesses that have high level high, like resilient Earnings, high levels of recurring um, revenues, um, low capital intensity, lots of free cash flow, businesses that can sort of, you know, charge what they like or to a certain degree, not ones that are sort of beholden, you know, they're dealing in commodity products with few structural advantages. I mean, they're just tough areas. So it's, 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 it's not a criticism of the company. You could have absolute geniuses running this thing, but it's just too hard and as I, as I said before with with the market the, the great thing about it is is that you've got literally thousands of companies to choose from and really you never want more than about 20 companies in a portfolio anyway so the question for me isn't is CSR a reasonable investment it's is it one of the 20 best investments that you can find on the ASX and there are undoubtedly 20 other companies that have far more favorable characteristics than this one Okay, so I know from Andrew, I mean, when I think CSR, I think building products, but in fact, it's an aluminium business, building products, as well as property development. And unfortunately, the problems it's been having in its aluminium division have been overriding the positive tower winds that we've been seeing in the residential building space. Yeah. Um, do you see any solution to CSR's work? It's, it's not one I'd be buying. Um, yeah, I think aluminium accounts for no more than 20% anyway of, um, uh, of the business, but I think I think the market's concerned that, um, despite what all the analysts think, we think it's well under undervalued here. Um, I think the market's concerned that we've we've hit the best part of of that um, the, that housing growth, that building growth, uh, and now it's going to start to tail off. Um, in terms of how it's trading, uh, at the beginning of July, um, it did break that longer-term uptrend. So, um, since the beginning, sorry, since mid 2012, it's been in a beautiful uptrend. It broke that in July. Um, went back to retest that uh, at the end of July and then failed. So, in my opinion, it's probably going to drop to about 280. You might get a bit of a short bounce out of it, but at the moment, I don't see any, um, you know, solid support in sight for, for CSR. Okay, so both our panelists with a no on CSR. We have another email here now from Luke who asks, "I'd like your thoughts on car sales and flight centre for a long-term investment five-year plan." Thank you from Luke. Let's start off with car sales, um, stock that's been under pressure and I guess it's because this is a stock that typically has traded at a growth premium and a growth PE ratio um, but at the moment you know the classified section is not really growing at a growth rate stock it's more just sort of chugging along so um andrew do you think this will turn around would you be buying car sales right now um yeah i would i think it's a great company this is one of the exactly kind of company i was talking about before you know they, these guys own the market these guys have phenomenal margins these guys have very low capital intensity they have pricing power because they own the market right so they they, they can they got a, a great deal of, of power to sort of charge what they like so yes earnings have come back a little bit it had absolutely explosive growth as it started I mean that's never going to be maintained you know it's, it's we live in a finite world things just don't go up forever but that doesn't mean and as I said before you know the pendulum swings both ways so the market was just in love with this Earth, uh, growth started to you know slow a little bit and then and then it's just it comes sort of crashing down but again that's an opportunity as far as I see it you know the question is as I said before not so much is this is this um, a, a good price relative to where it's been is it a good price relative to what you think the underlying businesses is capable of longer term our uh, our kids and grandkids will be probably buying their cars through here or doing a lot of research through it and they'll be expanding overseas uh, I know they've got a uh, a pretty um, significant strategic holding in ICAR Asia that's doing some exciting things too very early stage but big market potential there and I think it's a, I think it's a great investment and it's one that is actually offering a pretty decent yield as well for for a company that's got a bit of growth left I, I like it okay so yes from Andrew um, do you think Kassas is going uh, it's going to bounce off these levels because um, it, it mm. has been around these areas yeah around it's about six months ago um, well, I'm not very excited about the chart I think it could possibly bounce um, in the short term, maybe get its head above 
ten dollars again. But I mean, I'd, I'd be tempted to um, to sell out if uh, again because because of where the market is and all the other opportunities. Uh, as, as Andrew touched on, there is even though he likes it, there is that. Um, struggle to come to terms with, okay, the best part of their growth is behind them. They're a much more mature business now. They're market leaders, definitely, but just trying to put a price on, on a business in this phase of its cycle, um, I think, is, is a bit difficult. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it, it'll, you know, it'll always be there, probably um, ticking along around current levels, um, paying maybe a half decent dividend. But um, I'd be looking for, for other opportunities in the market. What about Flight Centre? Flight Centre, in terms of would I be holding it five years from now, probably not. Um, it is one that we mentioned here on the show about a month or two ago when it was oversold. And we said, look, as long as it uh, had a half decent result, um, the thing will pop because you know there were also a lot of um, short positions on it. I mean that's happened. Um, I can see flight set heading up towards $40, uh, possibly $44, um, at which point I'd probably reassess and be jumping out of it. Um, yeah, the result was better than expected. Um, uh, I think business business travels uh, better than what the market expected, but there is that currency headwind now, and and what you would have noticed is a lot of economists have started to move their forecasts for the Aussie dollar from, you know, the low 70s, mid 70s, now down to 60s, we've seen 50s. So I think with that trend in terms of the Aussie dollar, um, there could be some headwinds. But shorter term, I could still see a little bit of upside for Flight Centre. Um, flight Centre? Yeah, I'd hold it for five years. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a business. I mean, the nature of, of the travel industry is it, it, it is cyclical, you know, by definition. It's one of the more cyclical ones. But, you know, for someone who's looking to sort of hold for, for a good period of time, I'd, I'd suggest five years is really a minimum period of time to hold anything is my, my uh, point of view. But, um, uh, yeah, I, I think it represents it's an extraordinarily well-run company. It's got a super strong balance sheet. So, you know, these guys will, will, will be able to weather a hell of a storm. And they're a business that just continue to, to kick goals and, and they're expanding overseas. And, you know, I don't, I, I don't, I think the currency thing gets over, overblown to some extent. I mean, I, I can't think, throughout my life, the Aussie dollar's done all kinds of things and people want to go overseas in the past. I think they'll want to go overseas in the future. It influences things, okay. but it doesn't change the... So do either of you have an international leisure trip booked before year end? Uh, I've got young kids, I'm not going anywhere. No, so <laughs> Same. Not. Yes. Just had one a few months ago, oh, young kids, so I'm not going anywhere too soon. Yeah. So the other thing is, well, they've got more and more of their operations overseas, right? So, I mean, that's going to translate back in a favourable way. So it's a bit of swings and roundabouts there. And again, I think what, what a lot of the market participants do is they get really sort of super focused on, you know, what's going to happen next six months, next 12 months, and I have no idea. Maybe they're right. But I do see an extremely well-run business that's just absolutely dominated space with wonderful growth opportunities long term. It'll be a bumpy ride, I can guarantee you of that, but for someone who's prepared to hold it for a, a long time, and you know what, collect a pretty robust dividend along the way, 4.2% fully frank, it's not bad, um, yeah, I think it's a good pick. You know what I love about it, um, the CEO is its largest shareholder, um, one of the most smallest paid um, CEOs on the ASX 100, I think he's just over 600000 a year, and instead, you know, he's, he's got Fantastic skin in the operator. game. So Fantastic operator. That was flight centre that we were talking about there, but time for a short break. We'll be back with more of your calls in just a moment. Welcome back to the program. I'm Julia Lee from Bell Direct and with me on the panel tonight, we're very lucky to have Andrew Page from The Motley Fool and also Michael Gable from Fairmont Equities. And we are still here for another half an hour answering your questions. So if there's something you'd like to know, we'd love to hear from you. The number's on your screen there, 1300 30 34 35. Or you can send an email to yourmoney at skynews.com.au. So let's go straight to this email from Ian who asks, good to see Telstra on the rise today after a month in the doldrums. When will it get back to over $6? <laughs> Well, I've been on a bit of a shopping spree um, on the markets. I picked up this one last week as well, Telstra. Mm. Um, it has been sold off pretty heavily on a yield of 5.4% at the moment, although earnings growth still looks pretty atrocious. Um, Michael, what do you think? Yeah, it's, um, so it's given up the dividend recently. A um, little bit more heat's come out of it. Um, I thought it would only get as low as maybe about sort of 590-ish, but um, there you go with the rest of the market. It's, it's continued to fall. It, the way I could see it trading at the moment, it looks as though uh, it will head higher from here. So I think it's starting to find a bit of a flaw. Um, 
so to head back over six dollars, um, maybe mid sixes. Clearly, the dividend um, is still attractive in this environment. So, if you're looking to pick up more Telstra and you've already made that decision, then I think around about here is the, the good buy zone for it. Okay, so looking like a good area to be buying. What do you think, Andrew? Yeah, look, this is this is the income investors' dividend stock, isn't it? It's the, the dividend stock for dividend investors. Um, it, all that being said, it's never going to be one that I think is going to produce, you know, out, out of the ballpark kind of returns. Uh, longer term, I'm talking. Maybe it, maybe it'll do really well in the next month or so. But um, th there's a really lovely rule of thumb I think you can use for very well established businesses, and that is you take the yield and you add to that whatever you think is a reasonable estimate of long-term earnings growth. So with Telstra yielding about 5.5%, you know, you're really saying, if I want a double-digit type return, uh, longer term, do I think these guys can generate sort of 4 or 5% earnings per share growth and I, mean, I don't think that's that's too hard to achieve so for me I think Telstra's around about fair value it's 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 a it's a very good quality stock it's a very low risk stock um, it's a very good income producer you're not going to find yourself making 30 percent per year for the next five years but you are very very serious risk of getting a very attractive long-term return Okay, so that was Telstra, a stock that probably many of us have in our portfolios. Um, we have an, a caller on the line, so let's go straight to Michael from Sydney. Michael, welcome to the show. What's your question tonight for our panel? Uh, yeah, hi, Julia. Um, stock's one page, one PG. Uh, I got tipped into this thing, I think at $1.50. I oh, sold it nice. five, so it did quite well. <laughs> um, I sold because it just started looking stupid. Just wondering for the chartist to uh, let me know what he thinks, whether or not it's worth another punt. Thanks. Sure. Um, so, you know, one page, extraordinary run up mm. for one page. Um, the stock's at $4.50 at the moment. Um, I noticed Canaccord ha expects the share price to continue to rise in value to $6.37. Um, it says, you know, it seeks to monetize customers immediately by charging an affordable fee to trial the product and then looks to turn that into a fully negotiated 12 month uh, contract. Um, so they're quite positive. Are you positive on it, Andrew? Um, I it keep it's on my shortlist. I keep meaning to come and have a, a, a closer look at it. I love these styles of businesses, these these online software as a service type enterprises. They have a lot of potential. The difficulty for this business, as I understand it, I haven't done the work on it yet, but as I understand it, is that there's a lot of other people in that space competing competing for this. There's a real land grab out there at the moment. Whoever wins in that space is going to make a ridiculous amount of money. And if it's one page, I'd say it's probably good value at this price, $5, $6, probably even at $10. But, but that's the question to address. I don't have an answer uh, for that as yet, um, but, but it's not without its risks. I think the thing you've got to remember too is that the, a lot of the, the way that these pricing models work for a lot of these things can make the accounting a little bit skewed. Often there's a lot of customer acquisition costs booked up front and then you sort of get the recurring revenue sort of down the track as, as people pay their subscription fees. So, so you sort of front weight the costs and then all the gravy comes in after that. And you build up enough of a mass there, a critical mass in sort of it uses, you just get this sort of lovely sort of momentum. You ideally want to get what they call a network effect here where everyone's sort of using it. So it's like, you know, with Facebook or eBay, all these classic examples where, you know, you, if, if, you want to, if you want to do social media, you kind of got to do Facebook because that's where everyone else is and if that's what everyone's sort of doing for these as I understand it sort of job ad type things then then that's going to be super sticky super high levels of recurring revenue it's just a question of whether they're going to be one of the the few that, that actually make it and so that's the thing to address okay so one page you know based in Silicon Valley HR trying to source uh, talent and keep talent um, and really trying to break that US market mm. um, what do you think of one page do you prefer one page would you prefer something like seek what do you think? Um, don't know enough information about it to give a wholehearted um, recommendation, but in terms of the, the chart, um, just a little bit worried about that price action last Friday. Um, it was on decent volume, so it, it really pulled back last Friday, and it's the biggest move we've seen in this stock for, for a very long time. Um, and since then, it, instead of recovering quite quickly in the last couple of days, it's, it's just hovered around these current levels. So. Um, so technically, I think it might, there's probably a more than a 50-50 chance that it will um, pull back. I mean, the overall uptrend's still intact, but if you're looking for, um, you know, to trade out of the stock or back in, you could probably trade out and get back in maybe 10% cheaper. Or if you're looking to buy it, I think you'll, yeah, you'll probably get about 10% cheaper. 
Okay, I mean, a fantastic job uh, by Michael getting in on the stock at $1 and getting out at $5 and looking for an entry point back in. Michael saying that, you know, you could possibly get in around about 10% cheaper than the prices. But this is a stock that's up 1,500% over the last 52 years, uh, 52 weeks, not 52 years. It was, a, it was a backdoor listing that was a mining company before, so there's a little bit of, so you've got to factor of that in. backdoor listings on yep. the market at the moment, um, but the share price has been doing phenomenally well. We now have an email here from Anne who asks, is JB Hi-Fi a good dividend and growth stock? If it's not, can you suggest a couple that would be gro good for growth? Now we looked at Dick Smith, so JB Hi-Fi is the other one. Um, Andrew, what do you think of JB Hi-Fi? Uh, yeah, look, I think it's a better bet than, than Dick Smith, but again, I'm just more concerned about where its, its longer-term growth potential lies. Um, it, look, having said that, the market's not demanding a, a lot for it. You know, it's at a, at a price earnings multiple of about 13, so it's okay. But retail's a tough gig, you know. There's, there's, consumers have zero loyalty. If someone's going to be able to get an iPad cheaper next door, they'll go there in a heartbeat. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of the, the, the things that JB Hi-Fi stock are going to be redundant in a few years. I'm surprised they're still around now. Things like DVDs and CDs and computer games. Are you just going to download this stuff or just source it direct, stream it directly from the cloud? So, you know, I don't, I don't think we'll be, we'll be buying those physical things in a physical shop for much longer. That, that needs to be replaced and they're looking to replace that. Um, but, you know, you, you, there's a lot in terms of inventory management. There's a lot of working capital that goes into maintaining that. You're at the whim of consumer sentiment. It's a tough, retail's a tough gig. So it, it's not terrible, but um, it wouldn't be the one for me. Okay, so better than Dick Smith, but still not so good. I mean, what we have seen with some of these companies like JB Hi-Fi and Dick Smith is when Apple rolls out new products, that they get a lift in sales, and that tends to be good for profitability and good for the share price. Yep. We know that Apple's, you know, now due to roll out some new products. Do you think that's going to be a catalyst for the likes of JB Hi-Fi and Dick Smith? Yeah, potentially. Um, and, and as we touched on earlier, we know that JB is diversifying into other um, into other electrical items, into into household goods. Um, I think it's a good company. Um, I think there's decent growth ahead of it. Um, in terms of yield, if you include the franking, you're looking at almost seven percent. So there is a, a pretty good yield there. Um, I. It's fairly cheap, as Andrew touched on. I think it'll actually get a little bit cheaper um, the way it's trading. I'll be targeting closer to $17 on the stock. Um, at $18.50, it's a little cheap. I'd, I'd prefer to get it cheaper. So 17 bucks is what I'm looking at. Okay, so that was JB Hi-Fi there. We do have our next caller on the line, so let's go to Nick from Sydney. Nick, welcome to the show. What's your question tonight for our panel? Hi, Nick. Hi. Uh, stock I'm interested in is uh, Triton Resources, T-O-N. Um, they've come a long way back from uh, 64 cents, I think it was, wow. a few months back. I just want to, think, want to know what the panel thinks and where they're heading. Okay, so having a look at Triton Resources, once again looking at graphite here, um, the share price has been mainly trending down for most of the year, but um, I guess just having a look at Triton um, I think it's also Mozambique. Um, what, what do you think, Michael? Um, yeah, as, as we sort of mentioned earlier with these type of type of stocks, um, I mean, as, as Andrew touched on, there's just, you know, they're all over the place as, as the market gets excited and then, um, you know, on, a, on an announcement, but then as they digest the news, um, you know, it starts to come back to, um, to more meaningful levels. Um, Graphite, it's obviously been a, been a very um, hot, hot area over the last year. Um, the way it's trading at the moment, yeah, it is drifting back, but I can't really see any flaw in it just yet. So, I mean, it could, could find support here, but um, there's no reason why it can't still drift into the teens and, you know, basically under 20 cents. So um, I wouldn't be rushing in to buy it. I mean, if you're a long-term holder and you, and you believe the story, um, I suppose hopefully you're already the type that, um, that accepts that it does swing around this much. But at the moment, 24 and a half cents, I think it'll... Um, you know, could potentially dip under 20 before it gets going again. Okay, I mean, we've seen shares like Magnus doing extremely well, but then on the flip side, you've seen other companies like Sierra and even Triton, um, you know, losing pretty much 40% over the past year. Mm. Um, are you positive on Graphite at all? It's not, it's not something that, that we're investing in at the moment. Um, given the huge swings in these sorts of share prices, I mean, huge opportunity if you, if you get it right, but um, 
yeah, these, these type of plays, it's, it's off my radar, I have to admit. Um, but as I've already mentioned a few times, the market's looking pretty cheap. So, you know, there's plenty of other uh, opportunities, I think, that you can look at. And I guess the problem is that graphite prices have dropped. I think back in 2011, they were about 3,000 US a kilo. Now they're 1,200 US a kilo. Mm -hmm. So different dynamics, as we are seeing in a lot of commodities. So given that the commodities route that we're seeing. Are you seeing any opportunities in this space? Uh, no. The, the, the thing is, I, I think people come at this from a very sensible area and they sort of say, hey, the demand for graphite is going to increase in the future, therefore I want to be associated with, with graphite. Um, and it makes perfect sense until you realise that even though you can be, it's a situation where you can be right but still lose money. So we could have gone back, I've used this example before, but it's a good one. We could have gone back 100 years and I could have said, hey, Julia, everyone's going to be flying all over the world. Like the, aer the aero, um, aeronautics industry is just going to take off. There's going to be planes everywhere. Um, and it's going to be very common to travel. And you think, right, I'm going to invest in planes. Or I could have said the same about cars. I could have said the same about agriculture. I could have said the same about any number of commodity based industries and by the way an airline seat is an, is an absolute commodity. So the, the, the problem is is that the industry as a whole grows but the competitive dynamic is such that because no one has a real way of differentiating their products I mean you know graphite is graphite is graphite so it doesn't really matter if it comes from Mozambique or my backyard you know as long as I can deliver it at a certain quality you know people will pay the lowest price so whenever there is a, a supply demand imbalance you will see all these new supply rush onto the market which just erodes the price. And then that'll, that'll flush a few people out of the system and then there'll be a bit of a, a shortage in supply and the price will go back up and it'll attract people back in. And you get this interplay going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, and overall things may grow. But most of the individual players in there lose money. And the only ones that do well, and by well I mean relatively well, is that they just have the lowest cost production and they manage to survive during the bad times. It's terrible. Get away from it. That's a very good story and on that note we are taking a short break but we'll be back to answer more of your questions in just a moment. Welcome back to the program. If you have a question about a stock or shares our phone lines are still open on 1300 30 34 35 or you can email us on yourmoney at skynews.com.au and we now have Matt on the line from Melbourne. Matt, welcome to the show. What's your question tonight? Um, I have a question about evolution mining. Um, I've just been following this stock and investing in this stock over a period of time and it's sort of been jumping around a bit but I'd just like the panel's opinion on where to next for evolution mining. Sure. So um, evolution mining, it's been doing quite well over the past week. Um, CEO Jake, um, he used to be the CEO of Sino Gold, um, and I think one of the different things about Evolution Mining compared to other mining companies is its hedging policy. It's basically locked in gold prices at 1600 Australian US an ounce. Its cash costs of 711 Australian an ounce. That's a low cost, low cost producer, which means it's making a, a pretty, you know, nice margin there, and it's paying a dividend as well. Mm. What do you think, Michael? Uh, it's a good-looking chart. I mean, um, you know, if you, if, you, if I didn't know what it was, if I didn't know it was a gold company, I'd probably be buying it. Um, I think, the, in terms of the chart, it looks like it's going to head up towards uh, the dollar, uh, about a dollar forty, dollar forty plus. Um, so it's you know formed a couple of higher lows, higher highs, and just looking at price action over the last few weeks, to me, looks pretty bullish. So it should continue on to a new high for the year. Of course, the biggest risk is the FOMC meeting, which is on the 16th, 17th of September. And if interest rates go go up in the US, then, you know, do the gold miners all go up in the puff of smoke? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> are you looking at me? Well, I, mean, I knew where currencies and stuff were going, I'd, I would not be here tonight, I tell you that much. I mean, we've, we've had a few, uh, you know, reasons to be fearful, let's call it, over the last few months. And I don't think gold's really reacted in a way that you'd expect it to. So. Um, yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't hold your breath on, on that. It's, it's interesting. I mean, I think the, the, the hedging contracts give you certainly a bit of peace of mind and that, but, it, but any hedging contracts for a finite period of time, then it ends. Yeah. And in the meantime, the asset, it's a wasting asset, right? So there's only so much gold in the mine, and when it's all gone, it's gone. You've got to buy another mine and develop it. So the price of gold, if I'm correct, has gone from, what, 400 US an ounce to to 1,200, or so, roughly speaking, over the last decade, and yet things like Newcrest Mining and Evolution, over that period of time, have not done well. So, so that, that's, it's an interesting case of where even when the commodity itself is gaining in value, the people who are selling it aren't doing 
that well. And I should, it should tell you something from, a, again, I'm taking a long-term perspective here, but I would, I, would, I would wager that longer term gold will probably be a little bit lower. Um, but whatever industrial use there is for it, we're mining and more than enough to cover that. The rest of it just sits underground in vaults. Well, so the strange thing about gold is that, you know, the supply never disappears because the forever. gold bars don't disappear. You sit there. You just keep on mining more and more. You can stroke more, them, so. you can rub <laughs> the gold, but it doesn't <laughs> do pretty. anything, you know. It doesn't produce an income. So it's, I know there's a lot of gold bugs out there and they love it and, and that's, that's great, but it, it's, a, it's a question of saying what can I do with the value of that lump of gold and could I invest that into something with far greater productivity? And I think the answer is yes. Okay, so neither of our panelists like gold. Um, I probably said earlier on the show I bought Northern Star and Evolution Mining last week for a, a bit of a short-term play on gold. But of course the big risk event is that FOMC meeting over in the US and whether the US does decide to raise interest rates. Because of course if interest rates rise there's a cost to holding gold, um, which a lot of people have looked on as an, a, a, almost like a currency play with the devaluation that we've seen in the US currency over the last few years. We now have a final email from Joe who asks, can the panel give me their view on McMahon Holdings and Treasury Wine Estates? Let's start off with McMahon Holdings, M-A-H is a stock code here. We'll try and bring up the chart. And of course, you know, mining services has been a difficult place to be, but the share price, a little bit of a U-shaped recovery here. Um, at seven and a half cents. Can it go higher, Michael? Uh, yeah, it looks like it might try to um, touch 10 cents. Um, but, you know, as you touched on, it's a sector that's, that's, that's very difficult. Um, I'd, rather be look, I'd rather be trying to weed out the bad stocks in a good sector than trying to find those one or two good stocks in a very big bad sector. And it, it is a very big bad sector, unfortunately. Um, but look, a bit of upside if, you, if you're trading it um, to about 10 cents. But beyond that, I think it might be a bit difficult. We all know that it's really hard in the mining services space, but I guess, Andrew, one of the things that um, helps McMahon is its strong balance sheet. So there's a possibility for capital management options if it's not winning key contracts. I mean, would you be willing to go with a stronger company like McMahon in that mining nah, services space? Nah, no, no interest at all. Um, it's all a question of perspective. You sort of look at that chart and you get a bit of a picture. Um, but if you go back three years, it was 50 odd cents, you know, it's just gone down. And this is, again, it's a question of, of sort of saying, you know, th these guys might be really savvy operators, but no one wants their services anymore. And there's, there's a gazillion people out there who are, who are desperate to win work. And so everyone's going to be undercutting each other. It's going to, you know, this winter is going to be long and cold. And it's going to take a long time before it gets better. Um, so things will bounce around you know it's great to have a strong balance sheet yeah that'll that'll help you weather the storm but you might not be earning much in fact you might be earning far less in the next year or the year after I don't know what the specifics are with McMahon but again it's it's a question of going with there is never certainty in investing but there is a spectrum of things that you go from I'm pretty sure this is going to happen to I have no idea so when you ask me about things like iron ore and currencies and that, I have no idea but when you ask me about things like you know what is, is I don't know business that came up before is car sales going to be around in the future and earning more today more tomorrow than it is today so like, yeah there's a, a pretty good chance of that and then all of a sudden the equation becomes much simpler. It's, there's still risk, there's still unknowns, but you know, again, it's this luxury of choice. Why, why do people want to take the really complicated, difficult bets that are almost unknowable when there's a whole range of other bets that are much more knowable? Okay, uh, well, is one of those noble bets, Treasury Wine Estates, TWE is the stock code there, seems to be turning around its fortunes, just concentrating on a more concentrating portfolio of wines rather than the big range that they had before. So 15 wines that they're concentrating on, it seems to be gaining some traction and, you know, doing well in China, which is a difficult thing to do at the moment. Mm. Um, what do you think, Michael? Yeah, especially when you sell Penfold's wines over there and someone else is selling a, a wine with a very similar looking label and you can't do anything about it. Um, just, just been having a bit of a look at that while um, you and Andrew were chatting. I, I think this looks quite interesting. Um, price action the last few, um, the last few weeks um, might scare a few people because it did try to go near that high in 2013 and it did reject from that but it didn't then continue to be sold down. It's actually tried to recover so 
I think it looks like it, it would want to go to a new high, and I've noticed that all the big brokers covering it, um, out of all those big brokers covering it, no one has it as a buy. Um, it's all hold or sell, and, and the contrarian in me thinks that um, there could be an opportunity there. So, look, I'm not saying it's a buy, but um, I might do some homework on it. Okay, so looking interesting at the moment, Treasury Wine Estates. Andrew, would you be backing wine? No, I wouldn't estate? again for the reasons I said before, but you know, I think it makes sense to, to hear what you're saying, that they're going to focus on a, a few select brands because you have to differentiate yourself here and you've got to get behind a brand that is well regarded and so there's a big focus on, on quality and building brand. When you've got brands, you've got pricing power, you know, so to a lot of us, there's not much of a difference between the $10 Golden Gate cask and the you know, super expensive expensive um, bottle of wine, but there are a hell of a lot of people who, who do value a good quality wine and are prepared to pay for it. So it's about, it's about actually, you know, uh, delivering on that, on that promise and building a brand and a reputation around that. And if you can do that, and if you can keep all your costs under control, then maybe, maybe it'll work out to be a good investment. I, I don't know enough to say definitively. Okay, so that was McMahon Holdings and Treasury Wine Estates. It looks like our panel a little bit more positive on Treasury Wine Estates than McMahon Holdings. Um, but both looking quite interesting. That's all we have time for today. Thanks so much to our guests tonight. Andrew Page from The Motley Fool and also Michael Gable from Fairmont Equities and to you, our viewers. Thanks for all your calls and your emails tonight. Until next week, I'm Julia Lee from Bell Direct. Have a great night. The information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.